and welcome and thank you for joining CivilNet. Today with us in the studio is Richard Giragosian. Richard is a political analyst and to together in our, through our conversation we're going to try to understand what these, the past two days have, have been, what's happening in Nagorno-Karabakh and what is expected, what, what kind of developments are expected. Thank you Richard for joining us today. And we are having a problem labeling what's happening in Nagorno-Karabakh these past two days because is it a violation of ceasefire? Is it a resumed conflict? What's going on? Well, clearly it's much more than ceasefire violations. In many ways, what was interesting was this is the most significant escalation and military offensive that we've seen since the signing of the 1994 peace agreement. In other words, what's militarily significant of the opening launch on the pre-dawn hours of Saturday, April 2nd, was a major offensive by Azerbaijan, specifically targeting three fronts along the line of contact with Nagorno-Karabakh. What's interesting as well was a greater degree of intensity in this attack. Uh, in military terms, it's the combined arms. In other words, the coordination of ground infantry forces with tanks, artillery, armored personnel carriers, and helicopters. In other words, militarily, the Azerbaijanis performed much better than many expected. What was interesting as well is the first time in many years, the military objectives of the Azerbaijani side were much more ambitious. This wasn't simply a violation, an attack, or any kind of message. This was an orchestrated campaign with limited objectives to actually seize territory and to hold territory, to remake the map in terms of Nagorno-Karabakh line of defense and perimeter strength. This is why it's so significant. What's also very significant is the third new factor, the timing. Because if we specifically assess the chain of events, the preparations and even the order to proceed with the offensive must have been given by President Aliyev either while he was in Washington or on the plane coming back. In other words, going into the nuclear security summit you know, of which President Sarkisyan of Armenia and President Aliyev attended, it's clear now in hindsight that the Azerbaijanis probably had already decided that their frustration over the lack of progress in the peace process has reached a tipping point. But and he returned just a day before, so there should have been a prior readiness or a prior... That's my point. In other words, the intensity, the coordination of this level of military campaign necessitates or, or requires adequate preparation logistically so that well before he even left for Washington, this was coming. And in many ways, that's why this attack was also a direct attack against the Minsk group, against the peace process, not just the ceasefire. And what we see now, we're in the second day. This has lasted in duration much longer than usual, much longer than expected. Where we are in the late afternoon, early evening of the second day, we see the Azerbaijani side now dangerously overextended in terms of supply lines ammunition, logistical support. They simply cannot keep fighting if they wanted to. Hence this call for a so-called yeah, ceasefire. Was, yes, that was going to be my second question. That kind of like the international community was the headlines, Azerbaijan uh, is ready to, to all this unilateral ceasefire. And what is happening is there immediately the Armenian defense minister responded saying that this is an information trap. And right after that, uh, now the Harabakh defense army is saying we are ready to sit down and negotiate given that the map that was before the April 1st attack be restored? Well, let's look at the tactics. From the Azerbaijani point of view, we must give them credit for being innovative and original. In other words, this so-called unilateral truce was a very good bluff because it unfortunately fooled much of the international media and the international community. Because all parties to the conflict, including Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia, of course would want to return to the ceasefire. What the Azerbaijani attack was, was a direct violation of the very ceasefire that they now claim to be offering. What's more important is two hours after supposedly offering this truce, 
Azerbaijani artillery units were still firing on civilian population centers in Mardegert. Now, what this also means that, similar to the Israeli wars in the Middle East, this offer of ceasefire is often much less about military tactics and much more about diplomatic dividends. And we still see Azerbaijan driven by a diplomatic calendar in timing and driven by domestic dividends within Azerbaijan, which means for the Armenian military, it's very hard to respond and counter to such a reckless, unpredictable behavior that's not based on military logic. So in other words, until events on the ground confirm that the Azerbaijanis have silenced their guns, then there is no even likelihood of a truce or ceasefire. Moreover, there's little leverage. The West has very little leverage to pressure or persuade Azerbaijan to climb back down. The good news, however, is the events on the ground now in the second day where the Armenian side has the upper hand. In terms of Nagorno-Karabakh defense, uh, much of the territory that was initially seized by the Azerbaijanis are now back in the hands of the Armenian forces and Karabakh forces. And what we see now is the Azerbaijanis suffered much higher level of loss in personnel and equipment than they expected when they first launched this offensive. Is that because the, they underestimated the Armenian side or the Armenian defense Well, it was Army? a dangerous combination of underestimating the performance and capability of the Armenian defensive forces and Karabakh Defense Army and overestimating the Azerbaijani ability because this was very much a surprise attack, let's be honest. This level of intensity and when it happened were very much a surprise. But fortunately, after three hours, when it was first launched on Saturday morning, by 9 a.m. that morning, the Armenian counteroffensive quickly repelled much of the aggression. The problem now is what next? Even if the Azerbaijanis cease, even if they desist in terms of attacks. What's to stop them in two or three weeks from re-equipping, re-arming, and once again attacking Tavush or from Nagichevan? What we see is this, let's say, policy or pursuit of diplomacy has become dead. In many ways, this is the danger. And in reality, the Americans, the French as mediators, have little they can do to convince or pressure the Azerbaijanis, while Russia is the one party that's arming both sides and that may now seek a dangerous deployment of peacekeepers, which is very much against the interests of Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. And there's another view that this is something that's spilling over from the conflict uh, in, uh, be from the tension between um, Russia, Russia and, Turkey. And, and Turkey. It's not. In other words, what we see is a different perspective. In fact, in many ways, the Russian buildup in Armenia at the base in Gumri, at the military airfield, that is linked directly to the crisis between Russia and Turkey. But in this context, Russia in no way instigated this. Perhaps they contributed to the misperception in Baku that the Azerbaijanis could move, could attack. But we don't see a Russian capacity to actually trigger such an important and extensive attack. Rather, Russia is now in the best position to exploit the situation. And if we look regionally in Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Russian power and influence were driven by two key components, Russian citizens to protect or Russian passports and Russian peacekeepers on the ground, neither of which they have in Nagorno-Karabakh. So they may be seeking even arguing to the Minsk group that the only way to strengthen the ceasefire now would be to insert or deploy Russian peacekeepers. Fortunately, this is the one issue where Baku, Stepanagert, and Yerevan all agree. All are against Russian peacekeepers. From the Karabakh perspective, from the Armenian perspective, it's dangerous for two reasons. Because the initial victory of the Karabakh war from the Armenian point of view, was despite Russia, not because of Russia. Moreover, the second component of this 
is once Russian peacekeepers are deployed, they'll never leave. And why would Armenia and Karabakh, who are stronger militarily in the region, why would they give away that advantage to any foreign power, not NATO and certainly not Russia? And the Azerbaijanis are also justified in not trusting Moscow, despite receiving billions of dollars in arms. And Armenia's membership in the Collective Security Treaty Organization, does this play into this conflict resolution in any way? I know Armenia is not a direct part in well, this conflict. And this is yet another actor in the theater of the absurd, where, yes, the Collective Security Treaty Organization once and finally has actually criticized Azerbaijan for a change, very belatedly and rather meekly and weakly. But to be honest, the CSTO is mere coverage. It's mere an umbrella organization. The Armenian-Russian bilateral security relationship is what counts. And that's where actually we've been betrayed for too long in terms of Russia selling arms. And in fact, Russia is the number one arms provider to not just Armenia, but Azerbaijan. So the CSTO is a act two actor in this play, in this theater, but really not a consequential element, nor is NATO really directly involved. Richard, from what you were saying earlier, I understood that the Karabakh conflict resolution has come to a dead end because there is no military solution, there is no diplomatic solution to it. Where can this go and how? Well, long? let's be honest. Um, on the one hand, diplomacy is probably facing its most serious challenge since 1994. The peace process, if there was one, is now perhaps in stalemate and temporary limbo, but on the military perspective. What's interesting here is we shouldn't overreact. This is not outright war. This is not an official declaration of war by anybody. This is more about coming as close as possible to the danger of full-blown full war. It's a Cuban Missile Crisis. In other words, this is almost a danger of a war by accident based on miscalculation where events spiral out of control. The Azerbaijani offensive, because it started from there, had limited objectives, had a plan. But as always in military operations, the fog and fiction of war simply overtake planning goals and objectives. The other thing not to underestimate is the higher level of readiness and morale on the Armenian and Karabakh sides. And to be honest, the Armenian Armed Forces has not yet directly intervened. If full-blown war does come, if these hostilities do escalate, the power of the Armenian Armed Forces, which has yet to be fully deployed, will actually severely change the dynamic including the Baku Jehan oil pipeline. In other words, there are vulnerable targets on the Azerbaijani side, showing that there is a danger in their reckless, unpredictable behavior, if the stakes go that high. So probably the mil military, full-blown military action on our, at, in Nagorno-Karabakh might be one of the solutions to this conflict? Well, let's be provocative, but let's be honest. From the Azerbaijani perspective, they lost the battle for Karabakh, but they believe that they didn't lose the war, unlike the Armenian side. Realistically, unfortunately, it may take another war and the Azerbaijani loss, and only then will Baku be able to say, we have to give up Nagorno-Karabakh. And unfortunately, this may be what will happen because there's no political will. Armenia and Karabakh have no partner for peace. There is no one to negotiate with. If we look at the Russian, I mean the Azerbaijani ambassador to Russia's recent statement, he's the most reasonable, moderate voice in the establishment in Baku. And even he is now saying, no, there's no diplomatic resolution, only a military option. Maybe they're right. Maybe there is only a military option or resolution to Nagorno-Karabakh, but it won't be an Azerbaijani military victory. It will be a defeat. How can we predict that in, in a way? Because we have not yet to, uh, to test the Armenian military force. No, I disagree. I, I think in many ways, if we look at the readiness, if we look at the operational assessments of the armed forces of Nagorno-Karabakh and the Republic of Armenia, 
most Western countries, most notable experts clearly assess the Armenian Karabakh militaries on a much higher level than the Azerbaijanis. This is not an insult to the Azerbaijani officer or soldier. It's a realization that the Azerbaijani Ministry of Defense has been a core center of corruption for decades. Despite millions and billions of dollars in defense spending, that hasn't translated into operational capability. What's dangerous, though, is the recent acquisition procurement of more modern offensive weapon systems by Azerbaijan. There will come a point where they're tempted to actually use these. This is where it's dangerous. That's why attacks from Azerbaijan are not limited to this theater of operations. They are now a threat to regional security and stability, as much a threat to Georgia and even Turkey as Iran, and in that case, a threat to European and Western interests, as well as Russian interests. And now that it seems like uh, Azerbaijan needs a break or it's spre spread itself too thin on the Nagorno-Karabakh front line, uh, how long would we expect this situation, the current tension, to continue? Well, analytically, first from the Armenian Karabakh side. Fortunately, on the Armenian side, Nagorno-Karabakh's position, there is no offensive appetite. Fortunately, we can still de-escalate this crisis and climb back down from near war because there's no aggressive threat from Yerevan or Stepanagert to Baku. Moreover, what we see is the aggression is limited and the threat limited to Baku. What this also means is if the hostilities disengage now, this would be fine for Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh. The danger, however, is, say, timed with April 24th commemoration, say, the visit of a UN Secretary General, some kind of diplomatic calendar where the Azerbaijanis dangerously follow domestic politics and diplomacy as drivers instead of military logic. They may find themselves starting a skirmish or a fight that dangerously spirals out of control. And the reason this is more of a concern to the West is because this is the rare conflict that could easily and immediately draw in Iran, Russia, and Turkey in a real competition and clash. Moreover, we have to also give credit to all sides. As fragile, as weak, and as perhaps as threatened the ceasefire agreement is, it's rare in the world. It's the one ceasefire agreement with no external security guarantee. It's upheld and sometimes violated only by the parties to the conflict themselves. For example, the OSCE Minsk Group has a regular monitoring mission of the ceasefire. It's actually ridiculous that they don't have someone on the ground permanently. It's ridiculous that all sides to the conflict have greater capabilities like UAVs and drones to monitor the ceasefire. The Minsk group has none, doesn't have the capability. Moreover, inspecting the ceasefire, the OSCE is required to have the permission of all sides as to where they go and when they go. It's rather ridiculous. This is a time for the West and even Russia to strengthen the ceasefire. So this, this recent military conflict, let's say, in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, has it proven or made OSCE to look redundant or useless? Well, just like Ukraine. Not redundant or useless, but rather ill-equipped or under-equipped. In many ways, the OSCE in eastern Ukraine, after Crimea, is up against Russian aggression, let's be honest. But in this context, what's especially deadly is with every round of escalation, it gets more serious. We're not measuring ceasefire violations in bullets or the number of shots fired. We're counting bodies. This is the difference. Moreover, we see no punitive action, no liability, no punishment. In other words, instead of calling on all sides to disengage, we should perhaps name and shame the aggressor. And in many ways, there has to be a price to pay for such bad behavior. There should be a price imposed on Azerbaijan, including perhaps an arms embargo. Okay, thank you.
Thank you, Richard. That was, that was all for today. I hope to be in touch and continue discussing the situation as it develops. And thank you to the viewers.